everyone. Welcome to FACI Patient Education's Diabetes and Heart Disease Prevention class. My name is Tia Fernandez. I am a health coach here at FACI Patient Education, and I have the pleasure of educating all of you on how to prevent diabetes and heart disease through some simple lifestyle modifications. Uh, I work together with some of our nutritionists, our certified diabetes educators, as well as our clinical pharmacy team helping people with lifestyle modifications such as diet, as well as increasing their physical activity. And as we will learn in this presentation, both of these are very important if you want to prevent diabetes and heart disease. So let's get to it. Thank you guys also so much for joining our virtual presentation. We're so happy that we're, we're able to provide this service to our patients and offer these classes virtually for your pleasure to be seen at your own time and in the comfort of your own home. So these are the topics that we'll cover today. The class is broken down into two parts. The first part will be talking about risk factors for diabetes, and the second part will be going over risk factors for heart disease. Then we'll go into the complications for both diabetes and heart disease that happens in our body. And if we were to be meeting in person, we would be interpreting our pre-diabetic and cholesterol lab values. I'll print out your lab values from your last visit from your primary care physician. But since we aren't together in person, we'll just educate you on how to read your lab values and educate you also on identifying what are the normal ranges of these values. Next, we'll go over our lifestyle modifications such as creating balanced meals and also establishing healthy eating patterns, knowing the importance of fiber in our diet, knowing how to read food labels, and then last but not least, letting you know the benefits of regular physical activity. These three things are what affect and influence if you have diabetes or can develop it. So out of genetics, diet and obesity, physical inactivity, I'm going to ask you which of these are not in our control. I'll give you a moment of silence. Okay, if you answered in your mind genetics, you are correct. Genetics, we cannot control who we come from and who our family is, but the other two diet and obesity, as well as physical inactivity is what we can control and intervene in to lower our risk of developing diabetes. So when someone is diagnosed as pre-diabetic, this means that they can change their diet and lifestyle to lower their A1C. And the A1C lab value is just a measure of the amount of glucose or sugar that's in your blood. If the same diet and lifestyle continues for this person with prediabetes, they can be diagnosed as diabetic later on. So let's go over this slide here, loving the visuals. Um, prediabetes is the state that occurs when a person's blood glucose or blood sugar levels are higher than normal, but not high enough for a diagnosis of diabetes. So when you have prediabetes, that means your lab value of your hemoglobin A1C, which is again, the measure of what blood glucose in your blood is between the numbers of 5.7 to 6.4%. This is a great visual here. These red circles obviously represent our red blood cells. So someone who has prediabetes, their red blood cells may look like this. The blue little small circles are, are sugar, right? And this is uh, what maybe someone with prediabetes would look like. Someone with a high hemoglobin A1C level, this is what their red blood cells would look like. As you can see, more sugar in the blood. So again, low A1C level, high A1C level, prediabetic and diabetic. Okay. So like what we said earlier, when someone is diagnosed as pre-diabetic, this means that they can change their diet and lifestyle to lower their A1C. 
So as you can see here, this is a nice visual between the numbers of 5.7 and 6.4. That is the pre-diabetic state. So if you are able to change your diet and your lifestyle, anyone in, pre, in the pre-diabetic state can definitely impact their, their values to get into a healthy hemoglobin A1C level, which is any number below 5.7%. However, if you don't change your diet and lifestyle and it continues on um, a uh, you know, poor, poor management rate, then you may develop diabetes later on. So we want to really emphasize that um, by changing your diet and lifestyle, you can make a dent in your health trajectory here, okay? <laughs> All right, this is a great visual here. Um, when we eat foods with carbohydrates such as grains, fruit, milk, and sweets, this is what happens in the body. All of these turn into sugar. See all of these carb carbohydrate um, uh, foods, the pastas, the breads, the fruit, all of these carbohydrates, they change to sugar or glucose after digestion. And the glucose enters our blood to go into all parts of the body for energy. Now, when a cell needs energy, the insulin acts as a key to unlock the cell, and this opens the cell so sugar can enter and be used for energy. So when we have diet, when someone has diabetes, that means that um, a lot of things could happen. Um, either insulin is not opening um, correctly the cell to get uh, enough, um, enough energy in there, or there could be too much sugar in the blood going into the cell at the same time. So um, that would be considered you, you know, having uh, the issue with diabetes. But, um, uh, but if you're able to just remember that diabetes is an excess amount of sugar in the blood, um, that, that would be a, a great definition for you. And our cells only need, you know, a few, um, a few energized uh, sources. If it's too much, it can be bad. So um, that's where we want to prevent you from getting diabetes. So here are some symptoms of high blood sugar. You may or may not have known a person with these symptoms, or you may have maybe experienced it yourself if you're on the high range of um, your blood sugars, but you may feel thirsty all the time. You may have blurry vision. You may have the need to urinate often. You may even feel weak or tired, have dry skin. And a lot of people are often hungry as well. So now going into the complications from diabetes, it affects all of these body systems. And I love these visuals because it shows us all of the different parts of the body and systems of the body that diabetes can affect if it were not able to control our sugars. So let's go here. This is a picture of a nerve. And Complications from diabetes can cause nerve damage in the form of excess sugar can injure the walls of tiny blood cells that nourish the nerves, especially in your legs. And th this can cause numbness, tingling, pain, and if left untreated, you could lose all sense of feeling in the affected limbs. Damage to the nerve related to digestion can cause problems with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or constipation. And for men, it can even lead to erectile dysfunction. And this next body system here, this is a picture of our kidney, the magic filtration system of our body. So complications from diabetes can also affect our kidneys. So the kidneys contain millions of tiny blood vessel cl clusters that filter waste. Diabetes can damage this delicate filtering system. Severe damage can lead to kidney failure or irreversible end-stage kidney disease, which may require dialysis or a kidney transplant. 
So you may or may not have known maybe a friend, family member, um, close acquaint, uh, close uh, close friend or acquaintance that um, you maybe maybe had complications from diabetes and had to go on dialysis. Um, my particular family has history of diabetes, and many of our family members had to go on dialysis towards the later end of their life due to diabetes complications. So it's not uncommon, but again. If we're able to intervene with our diet and lifestyle before it gets to this point, that would be the best um, way to prevent any progression. So moving on, this is a picture of a foot. So in, in addition to the nerve damage, um, nerve damage in the feet or poor blood flow to the feet increases the risk of various foot complications. And when you have diabetes, um, if this is left untreated, cuts and blisters can develop serious infections, which often heal poorly. And these infections may ultimately require toe, foot, or leg amputation. So if you notice um, those people with diabetes, they have a hard time um, healing from certain cuts or wounds. So, um, that's another also indicator to see if your diabetes or if your sugars are kind of getting in the out of control range. Now let's go over this, eyes. So diabetes can damage the blood vessels of the retina, potentially leading to blindness. And diabetes also increases the risk of other serious vision conditions such as cataracts and glaucoma. Diabetes can also affect our, um, our dental health and our dental hygiene as well, um, affecting our teeth. And um, in addition, our heart. So diabetes increases the risk of various cardiovascular problems, including CAD, which is coronary artery disease, chest pain, heart attack, stroke, and narrowing of the arteries. Diabetes, those with diabetes are more likely to have heart disease or stroke. So that's why it's very, very important. These, these conditions usually um, happen you know, together um, and, are, and are connected. So um, we have to be very, very careful and um, do our very best to, to prevent, prevent it as much as we can if, if we can do it. Now we'll transition our presentation talking about heart disease and the risk factors for heart disease. So um, the risk factors of heart disease, this shows um, what we can control again and what we can't control. Obviously we can control our blood pressure, what we eat, our cholesterol, our weight, um, how much alcohol we drink. We can also control how much stress we do or do not you know, receive, um, as well as we can control our blood sugars and whether or not we do um, smoke and also um, be exposed to secondhand smoke. These again are the things that we cannot control that, um, that are also risk factors of diabetes. Again, age, gender, family history, and ethnicity. One important part to know about heart disease is knowing the common heart attack warning signs. Um, and we wanna educate our patients to, uh, on this as well because many people in America suffer from heart attacks. Um, year, uh, millions of Americans suffer from heart attacks um, throughout the uh, um, every year. So we wanna be able to educate you on what are the symptoms and if you are experiencing them or a family member or a loved one is experiencing them, you know how to act. So the first part is um, usually someone experiences chest discomfort that lasts more than a few minutes or goes away and comes back. Um, there are also discomfort in other areas um, such as the upper body like the back, neck, jaw or stomach, right? There's also shortness of breath you may experience, um, you know, sign number five, shortness of breath. Other signs are, are include breaking out in a cold sweat, feeling nauseous, feeling lightheaded. Um, and women may experience more shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, um, and back or jaw pain. So that's something to keep in mind. And this is usually the order of the symptoms that usually happen um, uh, when someone is experiencing some type of heart attack. All right, now we're gonna go into um, stroke. So again, uh, with complications with uh, you know diabetes and also um, 
uh, heart disease, you are at higher risk of getting a stroke. And this is basically what a stroke is. It's a blockage in the um, internal carotid artery. This is where the blood clot is in the cerebral uh, middle um, artery here. And it's basically an area of temporary blocked blood flow to the brain. And so when we experience this, um, and someone survives a stroke, um, depending on when they were able to get medical attention, they may experience some uh, physical um, uh, debilitation, maybe their right or left side of their body doesn't move um, as, as, it, as it did before. Um, usually people have some kind of physical impairment, whether that be the right side or the left side um, of their body uh, after a stroke. But we're going to educate you on how to see the signs and symptoms and warning signs of a stroke um, so that you can act quickly. Because as we know, um, stroke uh, complications from a stroke can be heavily avoided by calling 911 immediately when you notice symptoms so that medical team can intervene and uh, the damage will be um, less for the person who's having a stroke. So this is the acronym for um, knowing if you have a stroke or if a family member is experiencing a stroke. So first it's called a FAST. F stands for the face. So you wanna ask the person to smile and does one side of the face droop? And if yes, then call 911 immediately. That's definitely a sign of a stroke. Um, a stands for arms. You wanna ask the person to raise both arms. And if one arm drifts downward, definitely um, some loss of, uh, you know, uh, brain activity or brain mo mobility there. That's another sign. Call 911. S stands for speech. You want to ask the person to repeat a simple phrase. And if their speech is slurred or strange, that is definitely a sign. They could be having a stroke and you need to call 911 immediately. For example, my grandmother uh, did have a, a stroke, a very mild one, not a serious one, but um, we asked her, can you, can you pronounce your name? What is your name? And uh, she wasn't able to pronounce her name very clearly. It was slurred and very slow. So we knew at that point that something was not normal, something was wrong, so we called the ambulance immediately and they were able to intervene in time. Okay, and the last, um, part of the acronym is T. T stands for time. And if you observe any of these signs, again, time is of the essence. You want to call 911 immediately. So if you or anyone you know are experiencing the symptoms of a heart attack or stroke, which we just went over, you want to call 911 immediately. Um, uh, immediate intervention, uh, medical intervention can make a difference between someone who, uh, who, who, who will be able to have their life saved and less damage um, in terms of their quality of life later. All right, so now to the good stuff. This is the part where we actually go over um, some indicators in our blood and lab work, but we'll educate you first on blood fats. Um, these blood fats are indicators for if you have, um, you know, a risk of heart disease or if you, if you uh, do have um, some type of heart disease. So you may find in your lab work triglycerides, right? Maybe your doctor has gone over, oh, your triglycerides are going high. <laughs> what are triglycerides though, doctor? <laughs> so here, here's what triglycerides are. It's a, um, it's, it's a type of blood fat and it's increased by excess calories or simple carbohydrates. It's also increased by alcohol. Then another measure of blood fats in our, um, in our, in our blood is cholesterol. There are two types. LDL is lousy cholesterol. And this is increased by high intake of saturated fat and trans fats, but there's also the good cholesterol or HDL, which is the happy cholesterol. And this is increased by exercise, replacing saturated fats with unsaturated fats. 
So now we'll go over our cholesterol goals. So the next time you see your doctor or the next time you see your blood work results, these are the normal ranges. Your total cholesterol number, which is adding the happy cholesterol or good cholesterol, HDL, and the um, LDL should be no more than 200, okay? So if your total cholesterol value is over 200, it's a little high, you may wanna look at, do I have more of the bad cholesterol or do I have more of the good cholesterol, right? These are our happy cholesterol or good cholesterol um, values here, over 40 for men, over 50 in women. Our bad cholesterol, we should have less than 70. If we have heart disease, less than one, aim for less than 100 um, for someone who is uh, predisposed or has diabetes. And the triglyceride numbers here, if you look at your triglyceride, should be less than 150, okay? So now let's go over some blood pressure goals. So again, uh, having high blood pressure is a cardiovascular disease, and it is the leading contributor to stroke, circulation problems, and kidney damage. So we want to make sure that uh, we are able to know when we have high blood pressure and what are the normal ranges. So here is normal range. There are two numbers, right, in our blood pressure. One is the number above the line and the other is a number below the line. So here, this number is the number above the line, which is less than 120, um, 120 or less. And the number below the line should be 80 or less. You may have elevated blood, sh blood pressure if your top number is between 120 to 129 and your bottom number um, may be you know, uh, 80 or less. And you may be diagnosed with hypertension stage one if your blood pressure is 130 to 139 over 80 to 89. And you may have hypertension stage two, um, which is a little, um, little bit more severe here, where your blood pressure is over 140, over um, 90 or higher. So this would be a great risk of you having, you know, heart attack, stroke, circulation problems. So um, usually in hypertension stage one or two, maybe your doctor may discuss with you if you need some kind of blood pressure medication to help keep your blood pressure um, on track to assist. So that might be a discussion you'll have with your doctor if your blood pressure trends this way. But we'll also learn how lifestyle can also affect this as well. So enough of the um, ins and outs um, of the numbers of the nitty gritty and of um, you know the signs and symptoms of if you do have heart disease or diabetes. Um, but the good news is you can actually prevent or delay type two diabetes and heart disease through number one, more nutritious eating. Number two, if you are regularly physically active. And number three, if you're able to maintain a healthy weight and have moderate weight loss, about five to 10% of your body weight, that will also significantly um, uh, you know, prevent or delay the onset of type 2 diabetes and heart disease. So let's make these three a priority for all of us who are listening to this class today. More nutritious eating, regular physical activity, and moderate weight loss. Those are our lifestyle goals. Okay, so let's go on to talk about how can we eat more nutritiously? Okay, love this visual here. We give this to a lot of our patients um, here at FACI to let them know what kind of foods am I eating <laughs> more so during the day, right? We want, we want everyone to eat more whole foods with low added fat, salt, and sugar. If you see here, these are foods in their natural form, not processed, um, you know, um, healthy for you, fresh, um, fresh fruits. We have our complex our nice lean proteins, we have our healthy fats with our dairy, 
our legumes, and then also healthy fats with our nuts. And also we don't have any sugary drinks, right? We have fruit infused water to add a little flavor. Um, maybe it could be a nice uh, tea as well, sugar-free tea, which is great. And you can add some lime or mint to give it a little more extra flavor there, but awesome whole food options here. And what we wanna do is limit highly processed foods and usually highly processed foods are foods that have a lot of added fat, salt, and sugar. So look at all of this good stuff that we have here. We have our pizza. Oh my, <laughs> that's a favorite. Um, <laughs> we have our fried chicken, our you know hot dogs. And here in Los Angeles, we have our um, famous Los Angeles uh, dirty dogs that are bacon wrapped, right? With the grilled onions and the peppers. <laughs> um, it doesn't say completely eliminate it, but we wanna be able to limit this as much as possible. So just think to yourself, am I eating more so on the highly processed food column or am I eating more so in the whole foods column? And that will be a first step for you to really change your eating habits to um, be more nutritious. So less of this processed food, more of the whole foods. This is a great visual here on how to create a balanced plate. If you're eating your breakfast, your lunch, your dinners daily, um, your plate should you know, look like this. First of all, our plate should be nine inch in diameter. How many of us are guilty by eating out of plates that are very huge, <laughs> right? Um, those huge, large dinner plates um, often uh, exaggerate our portions and help us eat a little more than what we should. Um, so by lowering our plate size to nine inch diameter plate, we lessen the amount of food and are able to control our portions really, really well. So here we go. This is called the plate method. We want to make sure that half of our plate are nice, nutritious, cruciferous, dark green, leafy vegetables. One fourth of our plate is our complex carbohydrates. And what I mean by complex is uh, we want it to be not simple, not no um, uh, white white breads or simple grains. We want it to be you know whole wheat, whole grain brown rice, those types of things. And then we have our lean proteins here as one fourth of the plate. And in addition, we have our healthy fats like our avocado, we have some dairy here. And then we have a couple servings of fruit um, as well. So this is a great visual on how we should eat whenever we have our uh, biggest meals of the day, our breakfast, lunch, and our dinner. So think to yourself, am I having half of my plate as vegetables? Do I have half of my plate as maybe carbohydrates? Then that'll be a good place for you to, you know, make some small changes there. Um, more vegetables and then make sure that our protein and our carbohydrates are according to the portion here. You're, you'll be on the right track. <laughs> Okay, going more into our complex carbohydrates. So complex carbohydrates are what we want to be able to eat um, in our in our meals um, because they take longer to digest, resulting in a slower rise in our blood sugar, which is great if we're trying to prevent the onset of getting diabetes, right? And then it also has larger amounts of vitamins, minerals, and fiber. They also help you feel fuller longer. And when you're in the grocery store, you want to choose whole grains versus refined grains on the label. Um, the reason being is whole grains contain more fiber and more nutrients. When they're refined, usually the fiber and the nutrients are taken out. So when you're in the grocery store, again, look for whole on the label ingredient list and not enriched. This is a great visual here, whole grain versus white grain. If you see here a lot more layers, right, in the whole grain, which makes sense when your body is digesting, it takes longer to digest, so it helps keep you fuller longer, right? Has all of these layers to break down. <laughs> Whereas the white grain, super easy, very simple to digest. So if you notice, if you eat, you know, processed, you know, um, wh white grains or um, the, those simple carbohydrates is what we call them, usually get hungry, you know, after a short while, right? You end up eating more. So that's another contributor for weight gain and uh, not healthy over the long run. So a great thing to do for you if you find yourself eating a lot of simple carbohydrates, 
change it to whole grains, to complex carbohydrates, and that'll be a great uh, positive uh, movement for your health. Okay, here are our simple carbohydrates. They include processed starches, added sugars. They lack many of our essential vitamins and minerals. And like what I mentioned earlier, they make you hungry sooner. They are digested more quickly in the body because again, they're simple, <laughs> right? They don't have those extra layers of fiber, of, of, of vitamins in there. Um, and uh, when you eat simple carbohydrates long-term, it could damage the walls of your arteries, which then will lead to cardiovascular disease. So again, limit these foods here. Um, these foods usually come, you guessed it, prepackaged, right? <laughs> In the nice attractive packaging. Um, so just limit these foods as much as you can, especially the sugary drinks, the processed um, sweets, um, high carb, uh, high simple carb, foods. All right, now we'll go over added sugars. This is the hidden, um, I would say maybe it's a, it, it's a hidden culprit of a lot of our um, health complications now um, in, in America, not only obesity epidemic, but also increased uh, rise in everyone having type 2 diabetes, as well as everyone uh, prematurely dying from heart disease, you know, it's added sugars. So here, um, the recommended is nine teaspoons a day for men, that's the maximum, then six teaspoons for women and children. So it's important to note that one teaspoon of sugar is equivalent to four grams of sugar. And an example uh, is this visual here, one can of regular soda can has 39 grams of added sugar. And that means there are about 10 teaspoons of sugar in one can of soda. Look at that, 10 teaspoons of sugar in just one can of soda. But look at the recommended numbers, nine for men, six for women, right? So just 10 in this one can of, of, of soda. So um, if you are a soda drinker, if you know of people who, who drink soda, even if it's on maybe every other day or even just once a day, my goodness, imagine years of, of, of drinking that, um, the damage that you're doing to your body. So um, a lot of people experience great health benefits and a good um, you know, health trajectory if they're able to eliminate sugary drinks like sodas from their diet. So um, that'll be a great, a great start. Um, don't even drink these sugary drinks <laughs> in the first place. If you wanted to start slow, um, you know, you could limit your, your, your intake. Um, and there are a lot of sugar-free options um, as well. But again, we'll go over the, um, the, the labels later on. So here we go, fiber, very, very important. Um, the reason why it's important is it helps keep you full. So it helps curb your appetite. It also helps prevent heart disease, diabetes, digestive problems, and weight gain. And fiber is only found in plant foods. So if you don't eat enough fruits or vegetables, right? Um, would be the best source of, of getting your, your fiber daily. And what's recommended is 25 to 38 grams a day. There's two types, soluble and insoluble. And when we do eat fiber-rich foods, we want to remember to drink more water while increasing your fiber. And a lot of people have asked before, well, maybe I should, you know, I don't think that I'm going to eat or eat, um, get fiber just from my foods because I hardly eat fruits or vegetables or a lot of vegetables. Let me see if I can do a fiber supplement. Um, even though getting fiber from real foods are the best, you probably want to talk to your doctor about introducing a fiber supplement in your diet if necessary. Okay, so make sure you ask your doctor first if you absolutely need the fiber supplement. But we would also we would recommend you to um, try the real food sources for fiber. Okay, we'll go over the two types of fiber here. First is insoluble fiber. This helps 
and prevents constipation, right? Prevents and helps with constipation. It is not digested by the human gut. And insoluble fiber is found in foods such as whole wheat and whole grain products, vegetables and wheat bran. So these are insoluble fiber sources. See, um, we keep the skin on the vegetables because that's usually where we also get our fiber. Like for example, keeping the skin off of on cucumbers, on eggplants and potatoes. That would be a great way to increase um, the insoluble fiber in your diet. Now, soluble fiber. So soluble fiber attracts water. It actually forms a gel-like um, uh, substance and makes you feel full. They bind to cholesterol and it helps control blood sugar. It also helps keep your stool full. Um, and these are examples of soluble fiber. It can be found in oat bran, barley, nuts, seeds, right? Um, strawberries and many, many, many vegetables and fruits and citrus fruits as well, apples, oranges, things like that. And a healthy tip would be having a serving of fresh fruit as a snack or even adding beans to your salad. That's a way that you can incorporate uh, more soluble fiber in your diet and lifestyle. So this list is our magic list of foods high in fiber. If you can look here, maybe there are certain foods that you didn't know were high in fiber that maybe you were already eating. <laughs> and then maybe you may find foods that, oh, I didn't know that that had fiber in there. And you want to you know, put that next on your grocery list. Either way, whatever one it is, again, the recommended amount of fiber is 25 to 30, 38 grams per day. So look at all of these serving sizes of fiber. Lentils, one cup, any fan of lentil soup, right? One cup of that already gets you 16 grams of fiber. You're, almost, you're, you're more than halfway there the, of the daily um, amount of value. Raspberries, any berry fans, one cup of raspberries, eight grams. If you eat two cups of raspberries a day, that's going to be 16 grams, right? And then let's look at this. Look at, oh, almonds. Almonds are a great popular um, nut and a healthy fat, right? One ounce of almonds, which is usually about seven to 10 little, um, you know, roasted unsalted almonds are 3.5 grams. And broccoli, one cup includes five grams. But you'll probably get more bang for your buck if you Go here, artichokes, vegetarian baked beans, black beans, one cup, 15 grams here. But take a look at this list, see where the things that you like and see um, if you can put things together so that you can increase the fiber in your diet from our natural sources here, berries, beans, um, some few grains and fruits. All right, so here's a picture of how you can meet fiber recommendations. And again, the recommended daily amount is 25 to 38 grams, but the average American only gets 15 grams a day. My goodness, no matter, no, no wonder we have a lot of digestive issues and issues with constipation. We're not giving our body what it needs to help, you know, um, regulate <laughs> the fiber. So, um, this is a great visual, one cup of broccoli with a cup of raspberries and then lentil soup. This is a way that you can um, get your daily fiber intake with the foods that you can incorporate, whether that be in your lunch, uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner, or snacks. Okay, look at all the colors as well. Beautiful. Okay, now we're going into our protein sources. So protein is required for normal body structure and repair. It's essential for hormones, antibodies, and enzymes um, in our body to function, as well as it's an important building block of our bones, our muscles, our cartilage, skin, and blood. So we do need protein. And as we'll learn here, protein sources can be both veggie uh, protein as well as animal protein. These are some better sources for protein that um, you can incorporate if you're trying to help prevent the onset or progression of you know, diabetes or heart disease. So one is fish. Fish is a great um, lean protein. And what I mean by lean is has less of the, you know, um, 
less less fatty, right? <laughs> so fish offers great heart healthy omega-3 fatty acids. That's a nice buzzword in the health field, omega-3 fatty acids. And it also has less fat than meat. So incorporating fish about two to three times a week would be great. Um, not only uh, is it good to do that, um, to, to help manage weight, um, that'll be a great uh, lifestyle change, um, adding more fish to your diet. Again, um, poultry as well is considered a, another lean protein. You want to remove the skin for less saturated fat. Um, if you're looking for a vegetarian means of protein, beans are a great one. It's not only loaded with fiber, it's also a veggie protein and it increases your feeling of fullness, which is great. Remember fiber, fullness, right? <laughs> and nuts, nuts are a great source of protein, also a healthy fat. So a handful of almonds provides six grams of protein and heart healthy fats. So if you haven't, uh, um, if you haven't gotten to the habit of snacking on nuts according to the portions, you know, you can you can add that as a nice healthy lifestyle change for you. And the last one, seeds. So seeds, including chia seeds, hemp seeds, and flax seeds provide protein as well as fiber and heart healthy fats. So some people ask, where can I add chia or hemp or flax seeds? You can add them, add chia seeds in your drinks, in your smoothies. You can also add them in cereals, in oatmeal, right? Um, you can add all of these in, in, in that, in those types of uh, uh, drinks or foods. So now fat. Oh no, the big F word, <laughs> right? But uh, we need it. Um, we need fat. Um, it's a concentrated form of energy. It also helps absorb fat soluble vitamins, which our body needs on a daily basis, vitamin A, vitamin D. E and vitamin K. Um, fat also provides essential fatty acids. And we need fat, again, to in insulate organs, maintain your body temperature, promote cell function, and to keep the skin healthy. Um, but we want to make sure that we have the good kind of fats, the healthy kind of fats. And I love this uh, comic here. As we know, avocado is a good kind of fat. So um, as this avocado breaks up with its other half, it says, I said you're the good kind of fat. And, and this pear is right. <laughs> Avocados are the good kind of fat. So um, uh, we want to we wanna incorporate more of these, more of the good fats. So what are the good fats? These are the good fats to have more of. Uh, we want unsaturated or um, Another word for it would be liquid uh, fat, unsaturated fats. Examples would be olive oil, right? Extra virgin olive oil, avocado, nuts and nut butter, natural nut butters. Also omega-3 fatty, fatty um, acids that come from fatty fish like salmon, tuna, right? Walnuts, flax seeds, chia seeds. So these are the fats that you can incorporate more of in our um, diet, good heart health, and good um, way to incorporate unsaturated fat in our diet. Great. So these are the fats to have less of. So saturated or solid fats such as bacon, butter, lard, shortening, fatty meats. So this is a nice visual if you see when you're in the meat market or when you're in the grocery store, you know, the fat is indicated by the whites, right, when you get the meat. So we wanna make sure we get our lean meats, right, lean proteins. We want it also to have less trans fats. Um, trans fats are indicated by, uh, if we were to look at the food label, um, a lot of trans fats say hydrogenated on the food label. So anything that says hydrogenated, when you look back at the food label, put it back on the shelf, not a good thing for you to have. Um, and also trans fats are found in fried foods, also some baked goods. It's found in stick margarine as well. And trans fats are known to contribute to heart disease. So you guys are listening to this class because you want to prevent heart disease. So that'll be the first um, thing to, to do. Mm, limit or avoid the fried foods. Um, you know, the processed baked goods and um, 
we want to stay away from our saturated fatty, fatty sources. Okay, so these are ways that you can choose healthier as you go ahead and grocery shop to your new healthy lifestyle. Instead of getting butter, lard, or shortening, you want to choose olive oil, canola oil, cooking spray, margarine made with healthy heart oils. Um, um, you can never go wrong with extra virgin olive oil. There's also avocado oil out there as well. Um, instead of having fried or pan fried foods, you can opt to steam, boil, grill, bake, roast vegetables, broiled foods. You know, um, having a toaster oven or an oven is really, really helpful. Um, also having maybe like a like a baking dish is 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 awesome. Um, and then instead of having poultry skin or visible meat fat, you want to choose the skinless or trimmed meats. The grocery store has been really good by letting you know, oh, this is 98% lean turkey, lean ground turkey, 98% lean ground beef, 99% lean ground beef. So look at those labels. And uh, when you're getting a whole roasted chicken from Costco, uh, just go for the sk um, no skin. <laughs> you can opt out from the skin and just uh, eat the nice lean um, proteins in there. Also, instead of the creamy dressing, such as ranch or Thousand Islands, we want to choose oil and vinegar-based dressing. So those things that say um, lemon vinaigrette, um, balsamic vinaigrette, these are really good, uh, good ones. You can never go wrong with oil and vinegar-based dressings. Okay, so here we go. Let's do our little tweaks of how we eat. Maybe the picture on the left here, typical American breakfast, right? We got our sausage links here. We have our eggs that are scrambled. We have our nice English muffin with a sweet jam. And then we have our large cup of coffee, right? Maybe it could have some sugar in there. Who knows? But this is a typical American breakfast, right? In order for us to help manage our blood sugars and help with our um, our blood pressure and not letting our cholesterol or triglycerides go high, we can make small tweaks according to our plate method and change this up a little bit. Obviously, there's not much veggie or fruit or fiber in this particular picture, right? And a lot of um, um, simple carbohydrates, right? This uh, has our white... Um, you know, white bread here. Our proteins take up half of our plate, but as we know from our plate method, that which should be, you know, our vegetables and our fruit as half of our, you know, plate in veggies. So let's make a little tweak um, to our plate here. So instead of having this for breakfast, why not we change the portion size here? As you can see, this is a perfect plate method here. We have our nice low glycemic index uh, fruits, our blueberries, our strawberries, a grapefruit, really, really great. Um, we have our protein source, which is our scrambled eggs. This is a little less portion than this one here, right? One fourth of our plate. And then instead of having two, right? <laughs> two uh, English muffins, we just have half of that with some tomatoes on there. Um, maybe some seasoning and check out the bread. It looks like our complex carbohydrate bread, right? Maybe it's whole wheat, whole grain, English muffin. Perfect. We have our nice healthy, um, healthy fat dairy here and then a small little cup of coffee, right? So this is way healthier than this. You can also change your breakfast to this um, bottom plate as well. We have half of our carbohydrates as a, you know, nice, um, Looks like yellow potatoes here um, or red potatoes here, one fourth of eggs. We have half of our plate as our nice veggies with tomatoes, grilled asparagus. We have our honeydew um, fruit, and then we have some nice, uh, you know, maybe yogurt here. So this, believe it or not, these two choices here for breakfast actually are less, um, you know, calories and less fat than this one here. So choose wisely, little tweaks here and there done over a consistent period of time will have such great and huge lasting results for your health. So it all starts small and you just need to be consistent in doing it. And that's the beginning of a new life. All right, here we go, lunch or dinner. 
oh, what's wrong with this plate here? I wouldn't say what's wrong. Nothing is really wrong with it. It's just the portions, right? <laughs> we learn from our plate method. First of all, big plate, right? That's definitely not a nine inch plate here. But let's tweak our, our dinner. No vegetables, again, on this one, a lot of fried, right, fried potatoes, huge steak. This is probably a 10 to 12 ounce steak here, <laughs> right? Um, but if we're following our plate method, half of our plate veggies, one fourth of our plate protein, one fourth of our plate complex carbohydrates. So let's see how we can tweak this. Look at this. A lot more food, a lot more colors for less than calories. Believe it or not, this uh, meal right here could be close to 1,500 calories, which is a lot of people's daily, um, you know, recommended intake, right? Could be even, you know, more 1,800 calories. But here is about 500 or less. And look at all of the nutritious food that you have here. We're just going to tweak the steak size a little bit, make it three to four ounces, one fourth of our plate is our complex carbs. This looks like either brown rice or vulgar, <laughs> um, could be quinoa too. Um, and then we have our half a plate of our veggies, our green beans, our carrots. We have our fruit. We have even extra veggies here for a side salad with some nice vinaigrette dressing. And then we have our um, little fat or non-fat dairy here as well. So believe it or not, just these simple tweaks here, this meal will definitely keep you fuller longer than this meal. And this meal is definitely more nutritious in terms of getting yourself great fiber, good protein, healthy fats, and um, you know, getting our complex carbohydrates to also keep us fuller longer there. Little tweaks. So here are our snacks. Um, the magic formula for healthy snacks is pairing a protein with a complex carbohydrate. And the reason being is that this combination is a snack that helps keep you full. It also helps control your blood sugar. So these are examples, almonds with a you know medium or small apple, maybe some nice non-fat Greek yogurt here with some delicious berries, raspberries, strawberries, blackberries, and blueberries. Or we can have also some natural peanut butter with some whole wheat or whole grain crackers. These are great snacks to help, number one, keep your blood sugar under control throughout the day and not get you spikes of blood sugars, right? Um, and then number two, help keep you fuller longer because of your protein and your complex carbohydrate, okay? So make sure when you're snacking, pair it with this combination, protein plus your complex carbohydrate. Now, there are different um, heart healthy uh, diets that are out there that you may have researched on your own or you may have known on your own. We won't go too in depth on these, but um, one of them is the DASH diet. This diet is seen to help lower blood pressure and also the lousy cholesterol or the bad cholesterol. So this um, this uh, DASH diet recommends obviously eating um, more vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. It includes fat-free or low-fat dairy. It limits high, highly processed foods. It also limits sugar-sweetened beverages and sweets. And it has a uh, sodium or salt um, daily value or recommendation of 15 milligrams or, or, or less of salt. So this is the uh, picture of the DASH diet here, and you can also do your own research as well. But if your goal is to help lower cholesterol, help lower your blood pressure, you can explore having the, you know, doing the DASH diet um, too. And it lets you know what servings of each type of food group that um, you should have. And you can also talk with your doctor um, with specifics or also do your own research. And here at FACI, you can also work with a registered dietitian or nutritionist here to help with um, establishing a nice heart healthy plan. And um, you can also utilize the visits of a health coach to help keep you accountable to that plan and help you um, incorporate uh, these lifestyle changes over time. So here is another um, heart healthy uh, and, uh, you know, blood sugar, a friendly diet. It's the Mediterranean diet. And it has been, our research has shown that it's 
um, associated with a lower risk of heart disease and cancer, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, as well as breast cancer in women. And the bulk of this uh, uh, diet or lifestyle is that it's primarily plant-based foods. They use a lot of healthy fats in the Mediterranean diet. Instead of um, using a lot of sauces and uh, you know salty or fatty uh, marinades, they use a lot of herbs and spices. Um, for their foods and they limit red meat. So if you see here, it's a lot of poultry, fish and seafood in their diet. So a lot of good, nice, lean proteins and also good heart healthy uh, proteins as well. They eat fish um, and poultry at least twice a week. Um, then, uh, and they also get plenty of exercise. This one um, here, um, you know, Talk with your doctor about you know any alcohol use, but in the Mediterranean diet, they do drink red wine in moderation. But again, something to talk about with your doctor um, if you know you take medications in the evening time or during the dinner time, it could interact with any type of alcohol intake. So best to check with your doctor on that one. But Mediterranean diet is really great. Another way that you can incorporate all of the things that we have learned so far, including the plate method, if you wanted to eat a certain type of food here. This is an example of a Mediterranean plate. Look at this yummy Greek salad. You have your olives, you have your complex, you have your nice dark green leafy vegetables. You have your Persian cucumbers there. You have your healthy fatty fish here. You may be grilled salmon. Then you have a mix of different um, complex carbohydrates. Could be hummus here, could be um, you know, uh, garbanzo beans, could be couscous, could be quinoa, it could be also bulgur or brown rice, um, a lot of different options here. You have your fruit and of course your choice of beverage is water. <laughs> Okay, so now let's talk about sodium. Sodium is a fancy word of, for salt. And the American Heart Association recommends no more than 23 milligrams a day and an ideal limit of no more than 1,500 milligrams a day. And more than 75% of the salt we eat comes from prepackaged and processed food. It does not come from the salt shaker, right? So that's why we say limit our processed foods and our packaged foods because a lot of salt in there. Um, for example, I grew up uh, uh, in, in Hawaii and um, we love cup noodles, <laughs> right? Who else has grown up with cup noodles? But if you look at the, at the, um, at the food label and a cup noodle, it says 980 milligrams of sodium. My goodness, in that one cup noodle, and that's only for lunch. You already are almost going to exceed your daily value of cup um, of 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 uh, of salt intake, right? And it's not very nutritious either because, you know, no vegetables, <laughs> just the simple carbohydrates with the noodles. So um, looking back at, at my childhood there, probably had too much salt as a child <laughs> um, living off of those cup noodles. But um, always look at the salt intake and, and see how much salt is in there per serving. So where's the sodium? right? Bread rolls, baked goods, cheese, pizzas, cold cuts, restaurant foods, and fast foods. Also canned soups and canned goods like beans, vegetable, and tuna. You want to always look. Um, it's nice to say low sodium or no salt added on canned things, especially if you're buying like canned beans or canned vegetables. Um, those are the ones that you want to look for. No salt added, no salt um, low sodium. Chicken cooked and raw, there's some salt in there. Salty snacks, seasoning packets like gar garlic salt, chicken bouillon, um, taco seasoning, and then gravies and sauces all have salt. So just be careful with these um, and be smart and looking at the food label first and, and uh, try to avoid um, having a diet of a lot of packaged foods, right? So here is a nice visual of a healthy day <laughs> of eating. Um, if we can see here, uh, not, a lot of nice colors, a lot of nice uh, balanced, um, uh, balanced plates here. So let's look at the breakfast. This would be a great, um, you know, if you wanted to try this in one day, see how you feel. Do you feel full um, if you wanted to try this uh, particular um, 
uh, day of food. So breakfast, two pieces of whole grain toast. Um, you know, maybe this could be a scrambled or fried egg and healthy fat with the avocado. Your snack, maybe two to three hours later. Maybe breakfast is at 7 a.m. Your snack could be at 10 a.m. You have your complex carb and your protein, right? Walnuts and um, medium size or small size apple. Your lunch, plate method, nice green salad here. You have your fiber with your beans, your sauce or your dressing is a nice balsamic vinaigrette on top of the salad and you have a three to four ounce grilled chicken. Delicious. And then your dinner, you have your healthy fat uh, salmon that's grilled. You have your complex carbohydrate with the brown rice, and then you have a nice bowl of steamed or sauteed veggies. Super great, very uh, healthy for you. Um, good heart health and a nice way to balance your blood sugars and help keep you fuller longer. And over time, if you're able to eat like this, you'll see not only maybe weight loss, but also um, just increase in energy and, and um, overall feeling good. <laughs> so that's what we want. All right, now reading our new nutrition labels. Did you know that there was a new nutrition label? <laughs> this was the original label before. Now it has a new look, they say. If you see in the old label here, it says here, sugar is one gram. But now the new label, if you can see, it lets you know the calories in huge print. It also lets you know what are the serving size? What's the serving size for this amount of calories? Here, very, very tiny right in the original label but now we can see it a lot better we can make more informed choices as consumers and so um, it can also show how many total sugars are there and how many out of the total sugars are added sugar and remember um, with the slide that recommended the added sugar nine grams of added sugar for men recommended six or nine teaspoons i think and six teaspoons um, for women so this one has 10 grams of added sugar so um, out of the 12 grams so that means when they um, did this food they added a bunch of sugar to make it more palatable so would this be a good food choice mm, maybe not because most of it is uh, added sugars and we don't want that to be in our body right so another way for you as a consumer to be more educated and to be to to be able to pick uh, healthier options for you and your family all right, these are some reading food label tips. You wanna select foods that state fiber content as good source of fiber or high source of fiber. You wanna select foods that have the label whole grains in the ingredient list. And you wanna also select foods that don't list sugar as the first ingredient. And sugar has so many aliases, you may not even know that um, something is referring to sugar when you read it. So sugar comes in the alias on food labels. Uh, if you see molasses, if you see honey, high fructose, corn syrup, dextrose, all of these, anything that ends in O-S-E, fructose, dextrose, all aliases of sugar, <laughs> right? So um, just be careful uh, with, with that and make sure that anything that you buy, it doesn't list sugar as the first ingredient. And a very good friend of mine, nutritionist friend of mine always says, whatever ingredient is listed first in a food label, that is usually what most of the food is made out of. So they, they, they label the foods with um, the percentages of each ingredient and how it's represented. So if it's 80% wheat, then that wheat would be the first, uh, you know, ingredient listed on the ingredient list. And then it goes subsequently from there. Um, so if, for example, the label that you see has sugar listed first, that means most of that food is sugar, right? So we know that that's not a smart choice for us if we're trying to, number one, manage our blood sugars, and number two, prevent heart disease. And the last uh, food label tip would be don't have hydrogenated oils in the ingredient list. So again, look in the back if it says hydrogenated oils or the word hydrogenated, that would be your key to say, put back on the shelf, not good for me.
All right. Now, if you remember, there were three um, components um, that we can intervene in in helping us not get to the diabetic range and um, also helping us not get into um, a higher uh, heart disease uh, risk ranges. And that number two was obviously physical activity, right? So we're going to be talking about in this next section, our fitness recommendations. Um, a lot of people don't put exercise as a priority, but for the terms of overall health and and if your your goal is to help manage your blood sugars and also prevent the onset of you know having risk of developing a more serious heart disease um, we want to make sure that exercise is part of your routine, right? And it doesn't have to be, you know, the crazy exercise that you see on TV. You don't have to be a fitness guru to, to incorporate physical activity. It can be at your own pace and at your level. Um, and so we're going to go over the three types of exercise that you can incorporate um, in your in your lifestyle now to really make a dent in our um, in our uh, blood sugar numbers and our, you know, total cholesterol um, and triglyceride numbers and overall health. So number one would be aerobic exercise. Number two, resistance training. And number three, we want to break up our sitting time. And just as a reminder, you may need clearance from your doctor before starting a new exercise program. And we want to also know our body, right? So we want to know when to stop exercising. So for example, if you're experiencing chest pain or discomfort, shortness of breath, feeling lightheaded or having excessive sweating, that's probably something, you know, maybe you're pushing too hard or, you know, maybe um, it's a, an exercise that's a little too strenuous. Um, this is not uh, normal. So you want to uh, take a break if you experience any of these. All right. So the first type of exercise, aerobic exercise. Why is it important and what does it do? So it, this increases your breathing and heart rate. So we have to remember our heart is a muscle, right? And just like any muscle, in order for it to be strong and in order for it to be healthy, we need to exercise it. So um, by incorporating aerobic exercise, it helps uh, with increasing your heart rate. And by increasing your heart rate, that exercises our heart. Let's get the blood pumping, you know, helping oxygen go through throughout through your brain and throughout your body, right? So how much do you need? The American Heart Association recommends that every adult aim for 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity per week, which is characterized by breaking a sweat, and you don't have to do this in one sitting. You can actually break it up over the week. So at least three times a week, right? So if we say mm, maybe 20 minutes, 20 minutes, five days, maybe 30 minutes, four days a week, you know, you'll hit the 150 minute mark. It doesn't have to be remarkable numbers like one hour a day or two hours a day. No, if you can, great, good for you. If you can't, start small and you can even break it up throughout the day too. 15 minute in the morning, 15 minute in the afternoon, do that for seven days, you'll hit the 150 minute mark. So it's really all about where can you incorporate in your, in your day um, these pockets of opportunity to allow yourself some exercise. So some examples of aerobic exercise is walking briskly, dancing, swimming, biking, and climbing stairs. So just check even a brisk walk on your break from work. Um, or if you have a one hour lunch break, you can do, it doesn't take one hour to eat, right? <laughs> Usually, um, but you know, maybe you can incorporate 30 minutes of walking prior to you eating your lunch or 30 minutes of walking after your lunch. These are ways that you can think about um, incorporating exercise into your daily routine or weekly routine. And if you need assistance with this, health coaching is definitely available for you and we can work one-on-one -on -one to really figure out um, how we can stay accountable to um, physical activity because as we know, it's a very, very important part of our health. So the other part of uh, exercise that we can do is strength training. So what does it do? Um, strength training 
strengthens our bones and muscles. It increases our muscle mass as well. And how many sessions a week do we need? It's recommended two to three sessions per week. So for example, some people like to um, do maybe Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Those are going to be my aerobic exercise days. Maybe I'll go for a walk. Maybe I'll go for a run. Maybe I'll do a group exercise class online. <laughs> um, or, you know, when gyms open again, we can, we can do that. But um, then the other two days, maybe Tuesday and Thursday would be a strength training day. So again, two to three sessions per week. One set of eight to 12 repetitions is is um, is best, um, and you can do maybe three to five sets of eight to 12 repetitions, and this works the muscles to the point of fatigue for each muscle groups. So sometimes strength training is maybe you wanna just tone the upper body. Maybe you wanna tone our, your legs or lower body or strengthen your lower body. Maybe you wanna strengthen your core or your abdominal muscles. There's different uh, you know, exercises for this. So some examples of strength training would be you know, having free weights, maybe using machines, um, using your own body's resistance. If you see here, this woman is in a wheelchair, but she has maybe a one pound or two pound weights here, and she's able to strengthen her upper body by doing some maybe bicep curls or arm um, exercises, arm extensions there. So lots of different ways and lots of different um, uh, exercises and levels for people. No matter what your age, you can do strength training. Sometimes we think, oh, those are just for, you know, the people who are in physique competitions or the people who have the six pack ab abdominals. No, <laughs> strength training is for, you know, pe regular people like you and I. It's even good for your grandmother, um, you know, to help strengthen our muscles that support our bones and um, help keep us strong, right? And the last thing, avoid long periods without moving. So how many of us are in sedentary jobs where in, we're in front of a computer eight hours a day, and sometimes we just get so caught up in work that we forget to stand up. Maybe we only stand up when we need to use the restroom, <laughs> right? We wanna avoid those long periods without moving. So the recommended goal is you wanna interrupt long periods of sitting every 30 minutes to help with blood sugar control. So if you aren't already doing this, maybe set an alarm on your phone. If you have a smart watch, I know the Apple watch keeps track of your how many times you stand at least for one minute um, every hour. So that's a way to keep you accountable. But um, something to keep on your priority is if you're in a sedentary job or if you find yourself sitting too long um, and if you're retired and you're sitting too long, you know, at home, uh, maybe watching TV or not doing much activity, just make sure you're standing up um, every 30 minutes to help with your blood sugar control. Another uh, practice would be yoga. So practicing yoga as a part of an overall healthy lifestyle can help lower blood pressure. It can also help you with your breathing, so increase your lung capacity, improve your respiratory function. It also helps improve balance, helps with your circulation, and it also gives you an overall sense of well-being. So yoga is great. Another practice would be Tai Chi, very, very great for also older adults, um, you know, yoga and Tai Chi. There's a lot of resources out there to find um, yoga stretches that'll help with balance, with flexibility, with um, um, practicing your breathing. So really, really great to explore. And just as a reminder, yoga will not be included. If you practice yoga, it's not included in the 150 minutes of recommended moderate activity. So just keep that in mind, okay? Another very important part of our health, how we manage stress. Isn't that true? <laughs> Most of our um, health issues, at least you know, in America, is um, aggravated by how we receive stress and how we handle stress and if we can manage stress, right? So um, 
how we manage our stress and how we reduce stress is really very important for our overall health. And exercise plays an important role in that. Um, making sure you move, exercise, and play um, on a daily basis helps reduce stress. Making sure that you have a good sleep, right? Sleep is a very, very important part of our health, but a lot of us don't use it as a, or don't give it priority, right? So check your sleep. Are you sleeping enough? And if you haven't already, Facey has a wonderful sleep health class that is available online, but also um, available if you call our patient education line, um, we'll be happy to schedule you to do our virtual sleep health class. You'll learn lifestyle modifications to help improve your sleep. Also, um, ways to reduce stress, be happy. <laughs> Breathe, practice breathing exercises, laugh. You can also pray or meditate. Um, you know, um, those of us who uh, go to our, our faith also for some um, hope and, and, and stress reduction that also helps as well. Having great hobbies and social activities are also another way to reduce stress and planning ahead and taking charge and also letting go of the things that we don't have control of um, is another way for us to reduce stress. And asking for help when we need to, right? Um, sometimes I know um, a lot of us want to play the superhero and uh, we want to do everything, you know, on our own and, and we think that we can, but sometimes it's okay to ask for help if it'll help ease your, ease your way and decrease your stress. That'll be good overall. Um, and the last way that we can help reduce our stress, um, there are muscle relaxation techniques. Maybe you also meditating and visualizing what you want. Maybe a calming activity would be great. And, you know, maybe plan a mini get getaway. <laughs> um, and that could just be, you know, doing a staycation with family um, or you know, imagining a nice relaxing place uh, that you would like to visit that can also be a way that you can reduce stress. But however you like to do that, it's just very important that we're able to manage stress because increased stress can um, uh, increase the risk of uh, you, you know, aggravating certain chronic conditions um, such as, you know, diabetes, heart disease and others. So we wanna make sure that we're able to manage this health healthily. And lastly, smoking. So if you're a smoker or know of someone who smokes, smoking is actually um, a number one risk factor for a lot of uh, chronic conditions. People who smoke increases the risk of having coronary heart, heart disease. It also decreases the tolerance for physical activity, obviously. Um, and uh, it decreases uh, good cholesterol when you smoke. It increases also the risk of stroke. And you wanna also avoid secondhand smoke because the risk of stroke for non-smokers is increased by 20 to 30% if you're constantly um, in the light of secondhand smoke. And smoking is also associated with higher risk of abdominal obesity and higher production of cortisol or increased risk in blood sugar. And lastly, smoking um, provides, uh, you know, those, those who do smoke or people who do smoke, the insulin, which helps control our blood sugars, right? Opens the cell for energy. <laughs> insulin is less effective in smokers. So imagine if your key to help give your cells energy and manage your blood sugar is not working, right? It's less effective, then of course you're gonna have higher risk of developing diabetes. So that's why um, if number one thing that we can do if you are a smoker or know of someone who smokes, that would be the number one thing that you can help um, really change the trajectory of your, your health. Try and uh, quit smoking here at FACI, um, uh, I am a health coach, so uh, if you're interested in, in, in going on the journey to quit smoking, we can help you with that. You can give our health coach a call. That would be myself. By scheduling a smoking cessation appointment, you can call our patient education line, and the phone number is 818-837-837. 5779 and our staff are is able to schedule a telephonic one-on-one -on -one visit um, for you to start your journey to quit smoking. 
and we'll have some resources for you there. These are also other resources to help you quit, right? Um, again, ask your doctor to refer you to patient education to help you with smoking cessation. You'll be working with a health coach. Um, that would be myself. And you can call again, 818-837-5779 um, to register. Um, and it'll be one-on-one -on -one, uh, coaching visits to help you on the journey. There's also a Quitter's Circle app that I believe is free. It's for smokers who want to make a quit attempt. And this offers a support group, also information and tips that will help you throughout your quit smoking journey. And lastly, these are some physical activity resources from not only the American Heart Association, but others that uh, we at Patient Education um, like in terms of resources for our patients. So number one, heart.org, healthy living and physical activity. You can find some great exercise videos there. These are other free examples of exercise videos. There is a walking at home American Heart Association three mile walk YouTube video. So if you go on YouTube and you search Walk at Home American Heart Association, you'll be able to find this video so you can you know, do your exercise in the comfort of your own home. And for older adults, so seniors, maybe with limited mobility, um, still very important for you to keep up with your exercise according to your level of uh, physicality. So for older adults, the National Institute on Aging has a YouTube channel and they actually have um, a program called Go For Life Exercises. And these are specific exercises for our senior population. They have chair exercises, lightweight exercises, and low impact cardio exercises that you can enjoy from your home as well. They also have nice balance and flexibility exercises too. So explore that if you are in the older adult range, 65 and older. The Arthritis Foundation also has some exercise videos as well. And you can check out the American Council on Exercise at this website here. They have some nice home videos that you can do as well. And if you just search on YouTube, for example, low impact cardio exercises, low impact strength exercises, walking from home exercises. There are a lot of great resources um, and channels that you can follow directly right from your home so that you can keep up with your exercise goals. As we know, very, very important to incorporate this in our lifestyle. These are other resources for you, American Diabetes Association, American Heart Association, um, free meal plans available at eatingwell.com. If you're tech savvy uh, on your phone, MyFitnessPal not only has a uh, website, but they also have an app. You can track your eating and track your calories and track your progress there. And um, if you haven't already, FACI's Patient Education Department has so many great lifestyle classes that you can take that it's free for all FACI patients and also our surrounding community. Um, so you can call 818-837-5779, which is our patient education class, uh, patient education department to take advantage of our other free FACI classes such as weight management, um, healthy heart class would be this one. Um, and our chair exercises are so far um, paused. Uh, that's for our senior population and they usually come in person here. But um, other classes are available on our patient education website. But if you wanted to know of our other free classes that are available such as healthy weight management um, class and also diabetes class, and um, you've just taken the pre-diabetes and heart disease prevention class, um, please go ahead and give our office a call here, 818-837-5779. And lastly, I just wanted to let you know it's been a pleasure to educate you on how we can incorporate more nutritious eating, more physical activity, and also help maintain a healthy weight um, in order to help prevent the progression of um, diabetes as well as heart disease for you. I hope that this was very helpful in 
um, assisting you with establishing good healthy lifestyle practices. And let me remind you that if you need extra assistance at all, Facey does have a health coach that would be Myself, my name is Tia Fernandez, and if you needed extra assistance with keeping accountable or helping you with a lifestyle plan, I'm helping you keep motivated and accountable and um, working alongside uh, someone that'll help you on your journey to a healthier life, you may consider one-on-one -on -one health coaching. We now have that at FACI. And as well, we do have our dietitians and uh, diabetes educators that are available to to help um, to help you as well uh, with your specific um, meal plans and so so many resources for our facey patients in our community so please take advantage again by calling the patient education line for more information and if you would like one-on-one -on -one health coaching with your particular lifestyle journey be happy to help you and our number is 818-837 five seven seven nine thank you again for coming and hope this was helpful and live well everyone